Hi, welcome everyone to the fire safety verification method webinars for fire safety engineers. Um, uh, we're happy that you're all attending to this afternoon's session. Um, it, it's a new piece of work for us, which we're looking to do in the education space and hopefully provide practitioners with a bit more of an understanding on how to use the fire safety verification method as we move closer to 1 May, where it will be a, um, where all the states and territories will be picking it up to be used. Um, so today's session, is um, we have a, a few presenters. So I have myself, Alexander Armstrong from the Australian Building Codes Board. Um, I will be doing a brief introduction. Um, we've also engaged Paul England as a fire safety engineer to provide um, the main content from today's presentation to provide a, a bit of a further understanding on the technical details of the fire safety verification method and how to use it. Um, we'll be finishing up for the presentation session with Mark Wybrow from AFAC to give us a bit of a, a fire authority perspective as we move closer towards the date where it is an, a, a valid pathway for a performance solution. Um, and we'll be finishing off with hopefully about half an hour of questions. Um, so for a bit of uh, housekeeping, um, participants can log questions through the question and answer function um, that should be available on the bottom of your screen. If you open that up, you can type your questions in, they'll come through us. Um, we will review them and get through as many questions as we can. Um, otherwise, questions will be taken on notice and we'll be looking through them to develop further tools and resources to support the fire safety verification method. So please feel free to uh, put in any question you like. Um, apologies, we won't be able to provide much technical support throughout the process for this. Um, so if you send those questions through, unfortunately, they're most likely not going to be answered. Um, that's it for, from myself. I'm now going to pass across to Paul England um, and I'll let him run with the presentation from now. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, I'm going to give a, a quick uh, introduction to the fire safety verification method. Okay, um, the fire safety verification method uh, is uh, provided in Schedule 7 of the uh, uh, NCC 2019. Uh, it becomes active uh, on the 1st of May uh, 2020, which is uh, uh, just around the corner. It's a process for verifying compliance with the uh, fire safety performance solutions uh, with the NCC. Uh, other options uh, can still be used, um, but the FSVM does provide a robust basis for the assessment of performance solutions. Um, what is the performance of the FSVM? Um, well, essentially it's to ensure that the minimum level of safety required by the NCC is met using the concept of equivalence. Uh, a similar reference building complying with the DTS provisions is uh, defined, and this provides a, a, a useful benchmark for the comparative analysis. The analysis then uh, is required to check whether the level of safety of the proposed building solution is greater than that for the reference building. So you're trying to be uh, at least as safe as the reference building, but uh, in most cases, probably a little bit safer, which uh, is a good conservative approach. Um, comparative uh, risk-based approaches have been used uh, for quite some time from the early 90s uh, in Australia, initially based on the work of Vaughan Beck um, and the development of a, a uh, an early risk model called CESA risk. Um, there were also some landmark uh, analyses done about that time on quite complex buildings. Many of you will know of the 140 Williams Street uh, uh, project where there were significant reductions in uh, FRLs uh, offset by enhancements to sprinkler systems amongst other things. And that was uh, uh, undertaken using a multi-scenario analysis as, as well as some real fire burns. Um, the uh, Engineers Australia Society of Fire Safety uh, released the Code of Practice in uh, 2003, um, which uh, uh, has uh, probably got overlooked with time, but that uh, looked at uh, the Code of Practice for Fire Safety Design, Certification and also Peer Review. And uh, in accordance with the BCA, it recommended an equivalence approach to be considered and defined a process reasonably similar to the current fire safety verification method. 
except that it didn't include the specific scenarios that, that I'll, I'll address a little bit later. Uh, also, IFEG uh, from 2005 uh, indicated that uh, um, uh, comparative uh, and equivalence approaches were an appropriate means of assessing compliance with the uh, performance requirements. Um, so the FSBM can be considered to be facilitating quantitative approaches uh, for multiple variations. So you can address multiple variations with it. There has been a little bit of information going around that you have to consider each individual uh, variation independently and it's not very flexible for complex buildings. Um, the reality is that you nominate uh, a reference building and compare it to a performance solution that incorporates all those variations from the dean to satisfy. So it applies a holistic approach to evaluation, which is one of the major attributes for it. Okay, uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, so the next thing is, uh, uh, are the NCC DTS provisions an appropriate benchmark? Again, there have been questions uh, raised about uh, whether the DTS provisions actually uh, satisfy the performance requirements. Um, the deed to satisfy provisions have been rigorously tested uh, at, uh, going through a, a very rigorous process of public comment. Uh, the BCA, uh, which is now the NCC in its original format, was derived from state and territory regulations which were then reviewed uh, to form the original BCA 88 and the first one that was fully adopted, which was the BCA 1990. Uh, following from that, there was a detailed review of the um, uh, uh, building code uh, undertaken by the Fire Code Reform Center. And they actually pulled the whole code to pieces and then built it back up again. And that led to the uh, development of a performance-based BCA in 1996. And that's gone through numerous iterations being regularly updated based on detailed technical analysis and public comment. Uh, so realistically, the NCC DTS provisions are, are well tested and uh, that process is ongoing and it's open to suggestions for improvement on a three year cycle. So if there are any cases where um, limitations with the DTS approaches are, are identified, um, uh, the best uh, approach is to raise it with the ABCB and perhaps suggest some improvements. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, there have been a number of uh, supporting resources that have been developed to support the verification method. Uh, the main one is the handbook, and that provides detailed guidance of applying the uh, fire safety verification method. Uh, it provides information to assist all the stakeholders. You, you have a, a large number of stakeholders involved in a performance-based uh, design brief team. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail later on. And the uh, handbook identifies other relevant technical documents such as IFAG, national and international standards where appropriate that can be made use of. It supplements Schedule 7. It focuses procedural. Uh, and it really defines the expectations of how the FSVM should be applied. Uh, it doesn't prescribe specific method of, of analysis, models or input data. That's for the fire safety engineer to propose and the building certifier or building surveyor to, to agree along with other key stakeholders. Um, it has been issued as a, a preview document. And again, if there are any comments, um, they should be uh, forwarded to the ABCB. The handbook uh, references data sheets, which are uh, addressed on the next slide. Uh, and the data sheets have been separated from the main uh, volume to facilitate um, uh, easy update, so they can be rapidly updated if better information becomes available. They provide data and details of analysis methods that are useful, useful where there's more, more, no more relevant uh, uh, data. Uh, as I said before, it's up to the fire safety engineer and the building certifier and the other stakeholders what's used, um, but where, where some guidance is being looked for, it's, it's provided in these data sheets. Um, just briefly going through the list, um, the uh, B group look at design fires, so as overview looks at characteristic uh, uh, input data, looks at them in probabilistic terms as well as uh, 
uh, a prescriptive uh, uh, fire, a deterministic fire. Um, there are also a number of data sheets that look at the effectiveness of various uh, uh, fire protection systems. Th this is a, a, an issue where it's been identified that there, there is a lot of missing data uh, in, in Australia, very little data from Australia, but th there are some sources and these have been put together with the available information. So as, as an interim measure, these are useful uh, uh, resources. But again, if more information, better information is available, it can be used and they can be easily updated on an ongoing basis. So if there is more information, uh, make it uh, available to, to the NCC. And finally, the D group of data sheets are all consolidated because they're also uh, uh, integrated and relate to each other. Um, but again, um, they can be updated uh, if necessary. Okay, uh, moving on to some of the highlights. Um, guidelines to uh, limit uh, DTS uh, wrangling uh, when defining the reference building. This is a, a quite a sensitive issue. Obviously, um, the, being able to compare a, a performance solution against a theme to satisfy solution is a, a very uh, positive thing and gives a, a good sound benchmark. But the defining of the reference building can be very subjective. So a lot of effort has gone into defining some uh, principles that should be followed um, when defining the reference building. Um, some of these, just some of the main highlights are uh, the, the reference building needs to fully comply with the NCC DTS provisions, including relevant state or territory variations. So you could get a different reference building in a different state because of the state variations. It should have a same footprint, floor area, and volume as, uh, as the proposal. Uh, should be of the same general class, et cetera, as well. Uh, it's a little bit silly uh, comparing a high-rise building with a, a single-story residential building. So uh, common sense needs to prevail, and there's some guidelines uh, in relation to that. You should have the same occupant numbers and characteristics as the uh, proposal. Have the same fire brigade response times and arrival times after no notification as the proposal, unless there's some performance change that, that impacts that. Uh, where there are options of fire protection measures, uh, uh, and there are a number of NCC DT, DT solutions that give you three or four different options, uh, the combination that should be adopted uh, should be based on sound engineering principles that would be expected to provide an acceptable level of safety. So don't go for the bottom level, go for a reasonable level. Uh, if appropriate, include additional uh, features that may not address or fully address uh, uh, or be fully addressed through the adoption of the NCC DTS provisions. There are gaps uh, that, that aren't addressed, uh, such as provisions for evacuation for people with disabilities, they sort of fit in other, other parts of the NCC, but obviously you should be considering that. If uh, lifts are, are considered to be used for evacuation, again, normally you'd use those in, in, in both, uh, uh, both buildings. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, we're looking at a, a, a list of a minimum range of scenarios to be considered. Uh, and this reduces the risk of critical scenarios being overlooked. So this is a, a real strength of, of the verification method in that it says that you need to consider all these different scenarios. It doesn't mean you have to do heaps and heaps of analysis necessarily, but you need to consider them and, and make sure that they've been adequately addressed. Um, there, there are 12 main uh, uh, scenarios, but you can also be looking at sub scenarios. So you might have to look at fires in different places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I've highlighted a few that uh, I consider are quite significant and important. Um, the first one is uh, a fire blocks and evacuation route. Uh, this this is quite uh, critical, especially when you're looking at the number of exits available from an area, and and can have quite a profound uh, impact, and quite often gets overlooked. Uh, fire starting in concealed spaces, again, these, these are not necessarily common, but, but a fire breaking out of a, 
uh, a concealed space can grow rapidly and present some, uh, some hazards. Um, fire brigade intervention, I'm not really going to go into this in too much detail because we've got fire brigade uh, presenting, but it's very important that the fire brigade intervention is considered, uh, not just in relation to evacuation, but also uh, provisions for suppression and the fire brigade have to do their job safely. Uh, we've got a, a traditional, shall we say, scenario, which is a challenging fire or worse credible scenario. These things are quite often uh, uh, addressed in, in uh, standard practice. Um, but then we move on to robustness check, which is looking at failure of, of some of the systems. Uh, again, this has tended to get overlooked in some cases and, and is very critical. Not all systems are equal. You can have some relatively high reliability systems, which are, you use uh, put automatic sprinkler systems in that class when you start looking towards zone pressurization systems that are quite complex. Typically, unless a lot of effort goes into them, the reliability of those is going to be much less. So these are sorts of things that the uh, fire safety verification method brings out. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, some of the uh, procedural requirements and other features that are in the um, uh, uh, verification method. Performance-based design brief is mandatory, should be done all the time anyway, but it, it spells that out. And some of the participants are mandated, client or client's representative, uh, architect or designer. Uh, these are selected on the case-by-case -case uh, ba uh, basis, but various specialist consultants, if you're looking at structures, if you're looking at mechanical services, they should really be involved. Fire brigade emergency services are, are, are critical and have to be involved. And obviously you need an appropriate authority, which is subject to state legislation at the stage they can be involved in a project, but you need a, a, a statutory building surveyor uh, or certifier, depending on the legislation. Uh, the performance-based design brief team is involved in defining the reference building and this is a key job. Uh, as I've mentioned before, a holistic approach is adopted. Uh, the building incorporating all variations is compared to the reference building rather than a series of individual variations being considered in isolation. So all those interactions uh, are looked at. Um, tenability criteria specified in uh, if you're using an ASET RSET analysis, which is helpful Although for a comparative analysis, those tenability criteria are often less, less critical. And uh, individual and societal risks are required to be considered. Um, moving on, um, I'm going to go through an example, but I'll just give you a, a very brief, simple definition of individual and societal risks. Uh, individual risk is a frequency at which an individual may sustain a given level, level of harm as a result of a building fire in the context of this fire. So tidal risk is the frequency of N or more people uh, sustaining a given level of harm as a result of uh, a building fire. So we're looking at cases of uh, multi-fatality uh, fires, and these are more sensitive uh, in, uh, to the community in a large number of ways. Okay, moving on. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go through an example now, which will be a, a little involved, but it's, it's running through a case of uh, uh, looking at extended travel distance, which is a good example of how the F FSVM identifies issues that, that can get missed. So uh, this is looking at an extension of uh, travel distance from an SOU door to a single stair from 6 metres to 12 metres. So if you follow the, the principles of the VS, uh, uh, FSVM, uh, the reference building should have the same footprint of the building. Uh, the number of occupants and hence the number of apartments should be the same, uh, which would re effectively require the same number of apartments. So this yields a, a reference building, uh, which would require two exits. So you've got the same number of apartments, but uh, to comply with the six meter travel distance, uh, you've got two exits and you've effectively doubled the number of apartments and the number of, number of occupants. Therefore, when you look at this uh, proposed variation, it isn't simply a, an increase in the travel distance uh, 
and the time to tenability in the corridor for those occupants to evacuate, it's also a deletion of a, 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 an exit. And that will tend to have a significant impact, particularly on the blocked exit scenario. So uh, it's uh, appropriate to expect a detailed analysis to evaluate these enhancements for fire safety uh, designed to address the increased risk of deleting the exit. So it's not just a simple analysis that, that you might think on, on the benefit uh, on, on face value. So moving to the next slide. Um, but what, what if um, uh, you look at a, a, a single stair and you've just got an extended travel distance? Um, well, this is an interesting case uh, because uh, when, when you look at that, what, what you actually uh, do is you increase the number of uh, uh, apartments say, served by a single stair. So instead of the previous case where you had the same number of SOUs, you've now uh, doubled the SOUs served by that single stair. And you've doubled the number of occupants at risk. So what that has is an effect of uh, basically um, doubling the risk of ignition and also doubling the risk of uh, uh, or the number of occupants exposed. And uh, Grunesco uh, um, uh, is an example, and you can download this uh, from the web. It's openly available. I uh, just looked at a single floor, but he came up with an estimate of the increased risk of an increasing risk of 328%, which is in the right ballpark just by back of the envelope calculations. So again, if, if you did use this method, I, I emphasize this approach of defining a reference building is not permitted uh, by, by the uh, handbook. But if you did use this approach, you'd have to be looking at reducing the risk by about 400%. To, to get equivalents. Um, these, these are very interesting uh, aspects that are looked at. Now, if you look at it from, and, and with this, if you applied the fire um, uh, blocking and exit route, um, essentially very simple fire blocking and exit route that's very localized, uh, but quite hot. So it's in front of what the single stair, you would struggle to evacuate that, that, that floor. Your whole floor would be uh, uh, blocked. Whereas with two exits, uh, potentially anywhere between half and 90% and, uh, of the occupants on the floor could get away and, uh, and, and, and have access to, to uh, uh, an exit if they evacuated promptly. Uh, you've still got your asset, asset for your corridor, but these are the sorts of issues that do get raised and it also raises some design uh, options if you're looking at design, because uh, here, here, if we go back to the uh, previous slide, if you have a look at um, uh, the two stair option, uh, you, you, the best place for these stairs would be to put them at each end of the corridor so that you can travel away from the fire wherever the fire occurs. These are design details that also drop out. Uh, so we'll move on now to uh, application of the um, FSVM. Okay, um, I've uh, gone into the overall construction process here to see, to show how the verification method meshes with the design process. Um, you need to be uh, aware that the design process is, is much greater uh, than just looking at the NCC. So ideally, a fire safety engineer should be involved from day one and uh, basically looking at working with the stakeholders at, uh, to, to borrow some terminology from the um, uh, uh, Warren Center latest studies to derive some drivers and constraints from the stakeholders. And the NCC drivers and constraints typically are safety, health and immunity, accessibility, sustainability, and protection of other property to uh, a limited extent. When you look at the broader design process, you're looking at usability, aesthetics, costs, speed of construction, building flexibility, operational continuity, corporate image, environmental protection, 
heritage protection, workplace health and safety, other legislation, and potentially some stakeholders might want enhanced NCC uh, drivers as well. So the role of a designer is to look at all these issues and come up with a proposed building design. Once that proposed building design uh, has been identified, then there is a process of checking or verifying compliance with uh, the NCC, obviously, but all the other drivers and, and constraints as well. But here I'm focusing on the NCC and the, for, uh, and the fire safety verification method. So we'll move on now. Um, the next is selection of assessment method. Um, so the first thing that happens is that the fire safety um, uh, engineer would check compliance with the deemed to satisfy. And uh, if the deemed to satisfy provisions are satisfied, there would be no need to consider a, a, a performance solution. Uh, the building surveyor also needs to check that at this stage, the, uh, and uh, that's a, a key role for the building surveyor. If that DTS uh, solution, uh, or if it doesn't comply with the DTS requirements, then it's got to be a performance solution. Uh, the performance solution uh, uh, could be the FSVM if the method's applicable, uh, which we'll be looking at later. But other NCC assessment methods that are permitted could also be considered as well. Um, just to note, going back to the design process, um, a statutory uh, building surveyor in a number of states has a very limited role in relation to design. They cannot have design input because of the risk of a, a conflict of interest. So the building surveyor needs to be a little bit standoffish in these, uh, in these roles, but he should be uh, at least able to give some input if the um, uh, fire safety engineer claims that the deemed to satisfy provisions have been satisfied. And he should also be looking very carefully at the selection of the verification method that, or, or assessment methods that are being used. Okay, next one. Okay, so assuming you go on for the verifi uh, fire safety verification method, um, you will assemble a performance-based design brief uh, team. And the core st stakeholders in that, as we mentioned before, the fire safety engineer, building surveyor cert certifier, statutory, uh, emergency services, fire brigade, client owner or a delegate, and architect uh, building designer. There should be a description of the proposed building solution and an implementation plan. The impl considering implementation is quite critical because you have to be able to uh, uh, consider the reliability system and if your implementation plan doesn't consider all the necessary checks and balances, you should be dropping the reliability of some of the systems. So that's quite an important stage. Uh, the next stage is to look at a stakeholder analysis and selection of other stakeholders. Um, depending on, on the extent of the variations uh, from the deemed to satisfy, you could be looking at a range of fire safety practitioners that could involve emergency management consultants, active and passive fire protection system, designers, supplies, installers, various specialist uh, consultants, and I've in included a consulting building surveyor on this list because uh, if you need that uh, detailed input, you can't be using the, the um, statutory building surveyor for that. So uh, hiring another uh, consultant may be appropriate. Material suppliers, peer reviewer if there's one required, tenants representatives, building operation reps if they're available, a builder insurer. So that could be quite a long list. Going through the process, um, you've got uh, uh, define the reference building, very tri uh, difficult process, got to be put a lot of effort in. Uh, identification of variations from the NCC deemed to satisfy provisions. Identify relevant performance requirements. Identify relevant scenarios. And then identify methods of analysis, inputs, criteria for comparison, etc. So moving on to the next slide which is just recapping the fire safety engineer's uh, uh, role. Um, their fire safety engineer's involvement should begin ideally at the early stages, as I've mentioned, uh, and the performance-based uh, design brief team may not have been fully constituted, but it's good if it has. Uh, 
Uh, and once that design is adequately defined, you then move on to checking for a performance solution. Uh, a design fire safety engineer manages and documents the whole performance-based design brief process. He proposes the, or she proposes the reference uh, building. Uh, and as a minimum, all core members sh should be involved in confirming that that's a suitable process and a suitable uh, 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 benchmark. Uh, they identify variations uh, from the DTS and obviously the building surveyor certifier must be satisfied that all those have been addressed. Uh, again, identification of uh, performance requirements, et cetera, uh, building surveyor uh, has to be satisfied. Uh, the design fire safety engineer identifies analysis methods, inputs, criteria. Uh, the FSVM does allow uh, flexibility, so they can de decide what they want to use, but the core members of the uh, performance-based design team as a minimum uh, should be uh, uh, confirming that they're happy with that or explaining why they're not and other uh, uh, methods and data should be used. Uh, once the critical parameters have been uh, designed, the fire, uh, the fire safety issues, the, the uh, uh, PBDB uh, process is uh, complete and you progress to the analysis stage. So next slide. Um, the next slide is uh, analysis and sign off. So um, basically, if, if everything's been done well on the performance based design brief stage, this is relatively straightforward. You do the comparative criteria, make sure they're satisfied, you document your plan. Uh, if there are some things, uh, uh, if the comparative uh, criteria aren't satisfied, you'll have to investigate further mitigation methods and then update the pr uh, proposed uh, building and loop through the process. A key thing here is if the FSE is not going to be fully involved through the construction process, uh, responsibilities for ensuring full implementation, commissioning, verification and maintenance of the design should be delegated to appropriate practitioners. Not really an FSVM thing, FSVM is verification of the design, but there's no point in doing a design if it's not going to be implemented properly. So that has to be uh, 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 input. And then quickly moving on to the last slide, uh, which is looking at the role of the performance-based design uh, brief team uh, Post verification, often it ends. This shows you how complicated that process is, uh, uh, the construction process and subsequent building uh, occupancy. It can be split into three major processes, the compliance checking process, construction process, and building uh, uh, use and occupancy. Um, essentially, if you follow this, this chart uh, in your own time, you'll see that uh, uh, once uh, uh, the compliance of the verification method has been assessed, uh, building approvals granted by the building uh, 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 surveyor or certifier, that then goes uh, through to the builder who can start work. They rely heavily on a product supply chain. All that product supply chain is involved in providing documentary evidence and evidence that installation has been undertaken uh, properly. That's then overviewed by a building surveyor. Uh, uh, looking at auditing that process, who has to decide whether the building is fit for occupation, which isn't necessarily compliance. So there's a whole issue there that needs to be uh, addressed. And uh, once the building surveyor is uh, satisfied, he can issue an occupancy permit and building documentation should be issued to the owners that indicate how the systems operate and how they should be maintained. And that then spreads through to the uh, building use and uh, occupation. And I'd better stop there. I've run over a couple of minutes. So my apologies. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, now I will pass over to Mark Wybrow from AFAC, who will provide a bit of the fire authority's perspective on the fire safety verification method as uh, we progress closer to the 1 May adoption date. Okay. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to the Australian Building Codes Board for allowing me to speak on behalf of AFAC. AFAC's the National Council for Fire and Emergency Services. My role in AFAC is the chair of the Building Environment Technical Group. So we're looking at fire services, regulatory roles in the built environment. Um, I hope my points don't cover too many of Paul's, but there might be a bit of repetition there. Um, so we know the NCC uh, will now have a requirement 
that the solution provided by the FSVM must now be compared to the same type of building with DTS provisions. Um, the FSVM must be equal or safer to, uh, or safer than the DTS result. Um, we see that as a very good thing. Um, fire services, I suppose, typically are quite conservative. Um, we see the best and the worst of buildings, I suppose. And um, DTS is the recipe by which we've grown up with. Um, we do appreciate that this will uh, require additional work and reviewing by practitioners. Um, but uh, Paul mentioned before, the work being done by uh, the Warren Centre in terms of professionalising fire safety engineering, and that's something that both Fire and Rescue New South Wales and AFAC support. Um, not only for the industry, but certainly for the fire services. Uh, we need to come up to speed as well. We need to have the same comparable level of competence uh, as the rest of the industry to enable us to contribute to safer buildings. Um, uh, any design using the, the verification method will still have to go through the same approvals processes that now exist for any performance solution. It's not an automatic acceptance and it does not have the same acceptance as say a code mark certificate. Um, it's a requirement of the verification method to use all sections of the VM uh, and that if any sp if stakeholder has a contrary view and that includes emergency services or does not approve of the design or process uh, then that must be documented and attached to the proposal when submitted for approval. Um, another piece of work that's being undertaken by the Australian Building Codes Board is the review of IFEG and, and AFAC welcomes that um, and will be uh, collaborating closely uh, with the board in that review. Um, at the same time, AFAC is currently reviewing its um, fire brigade intervention model, uh, the FBIM, and this is scheduled to be ready for release um, with the FSVM implementation uh, on the 1st of May. Um, the fire services verification method is supported by all of the AFAC agencies. And although during the process of getting this into the NCC, there were comments in relation to some of the data, some of the processes, AFAC believes that with good faith by all parties, uh, any varying opinions will be sorted out in the fire engineering brief process. The fire services are a key stakeholder and are expecting to be involved as per the NCC provisions and the extent of the fire services involvement will be decided once a proposal is reviewed. Um, fire services understand that the use of the verification method uh, is not mandatory and there are other methodologies and approaches to show compliance with the NCC performance provisions. And regardless of the methodology used, fire services are expecting to be involved in that consultation. Again, work collaboratively to ensure the safety of building. Um, and that's important. It's, it's, it's the safety of the occupants of the buildings. But um, one of the things that I like to stress is that uh, the occupants do include firefighters. Um, when an emergency occurs, we become an occupant of the building. Uh, and one of the great things to come out of the VM, uh, and one of the, uh, I suppose, determining factors in AFAC support for the VM, was around the fact that for the first time, we were being considered um, as an occupant of the building in scenarios such as the catastrophic failure, number nine. Um, currently, the fire services around Australia and New Zealand are reviewing their approach to the regulatory uh, role as a result of the FSVM, but as well as fulfilling the recommendations of the Shergold Year Report. Um, certainly this will be focusing on the service delivery and we're aiming for a much more nationally consistent approach. And due to the different regulatory environments under which we operate at the state and territory level, um, there will understandably be some differences, but we see the FSVM as a means of ensuring that consistency because suddenly some states who, who may not have had a great regulatory input before uh, will become a key stakeholder and, and need to be consulted with. Um, I think it's a timely, uh, fire services generally, I think it's a timely um, addition to the NCC. I mean, as mentioned before, performance has been in the NCC or the BCA uh, for now, well, we're in our 25th year. Um, up until now, there may have been um, the best and the worst of, of performance solutions. 
uh, I see the FSVM as being one of those things that lifts the bar for all of us, including fire services. And that's it from me. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, we'll now move on to the question and answer section of today's presentation. Um, I will work through these as quickly as I can and, and answer these as succinctly as I can so we can get through as many questions as we can in the last 20 minutes or so from today's presentation. So I will start off with a question from the, which I will answer on behalf of the ABCB first off, which is the question is who is considered as an expert to provide expert judgment as an assessment method in accordance with A2.2, uh, RPEQ, PhD, et cetera. Um, so look, if you're after further advice on um, who is considered an expert or an expert's judgment, first off, we have a, an assessment methods, so evidence of suitability handbook, which is available on our website, which goes through and discusses all of the requirements for evidence of suitability, which quite covers um, these sorts of areas well, as well as then looking through the code for the definitions of expert judgment, expert professional engineer and the like. They will then also provide further, further guidance on this. And then ultimately it is the appropriate authorities, whoever that may, that may be in the jurisdiction you're working in, um, responsibility then to provide further advice or input on who is the appropriate expert and what that expert judgment is. Um, Paul, I'd like to direct the next question to yourself which is, does the ceiling height in the DTS reference design need to be the same as the proposed building or can the ceiling height be considered a design feature? Well, I, I, that, that's uh, um, one of the many entertaining questions that you get when you start looking at a reference building. And the, the reality is that the common sense needs to prevail and Generally speaking, you would have a ceiling that's the same uh, height. Um, if you wish to vary that and then claim that, that your, your building uh, is uh, okay um, um, because of the increased uh, uh, opportunity to evacuate the building, um, that's not quite the way equivalence to uh, a danger satisfied building should work because it you, you're effectively defining a reference building that's varied from your building considerably and therefore um, trying to utilize that that worst performance from your reference building to get your um, uh, performance-based design over the line so a, a level of conservatism is is appropriate like all these things under the right circumstances you could see something but the the handbook is being quite prescriptive on these things because of, of the sorts of uh, extreme interpretations that, that could be made. Uh, I used an example earlier of a, a high rise versus a, a domestic dwelling. It's, it's a matter of realistically your building should be the same. Um, you'd have to have a very, very good reason for varying that ceiling height uh, and, and that being part of your fire safety strategy and all your stakeholders would have to be in agreement before you could do it, uh, before you could use it. So I, I can't give you a, a fixed yes or no, because it depends on the circumstances. I would say 90% of the time, the answer might be no. Wonderful, thank you for that, Paul. Um, look, I think following on from that, and, and you might just either say that it's been answered or expanded a little bit more, is the next question, which is, why is area and volume captured as needing to be the same in both subject and DTS reference building? This results in a scenario where larger and higher smoke reservoirs cannot be used to justify potentially slightly longer travel, as an example. Okay, um, I, I don't know whether I, my presentation on the, um, uh, on the single stair issue uh, and the uh, extended travel distance uh, uh, necessarily got all this information across but essentially you, you when you increase the uh, uh, length of a corridor obviously you've increased the volume and you know if you do a, a simple R set a set analysis you'll probably get an extension in, in, in time and you can argue that that might enable you to travel that extended travel distance but the issue is when you look at at the the applying it to the same volume of, of, of building you identify that a stairs being uh, 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 deleted 
which is an additional var variation that wouldn't have been picked by that simple statement. This is one of the real strengths of, of the verification method. And if you think that that's being unfair and you want to vary the size of your building and the number of occupants, then your risk of ignition and your number of people exposed varies considerably. So you've got to be very careful with these things. And the, the simplest way and the safest way is to have the same volume, the same building. You would de design that as complying with the deem to satisfy and then compare it. And a, a key issue, which I really didn't mention in the presentation, but um, when uh, the performance-based designs tend to get questioned in court and looked at, the first thing anybody does is say, what would happen if this building had been designed to the deem to satisfy? Have you made it more safe or less safe? So by looking at exactly the same shape of building, you're really putting your defense in place uh, uh, just in case the worst happens in, 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 the, in the future because you've looked at the equivalent building and made it safer than a, a nominated benchmark by the ABCB. Thanks, Paul, for that answer. Um, Mark, this next question is directed at you. Um, it is, will the new FBIM be free? Um, this is still a discussion that's going on at um, AFAC level. Um, we need a, a, a source of revenue to continue to update and um, ensure that the, I suppose, continuous improvement of FBIM takes place. Um, I'll certainly let everyone know through ABCB office as soon as we come to that decision. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next question is also for yourself. So do AFAC agencies expect to have an increase in workload of reviewing fire safety designs as a result of the commencement of the fire safety verification method? I suppose that depends on the amount of take up of um, the VM. Um, we are expecting that, I mean, generally, we are expecting an increase in our workload. Um, and certainly we have flagged through to the AFAC Council, which is um, the board, if you like, of AFAC, the chief officers and commissioners, uh, that there is a growing expectation from both government, regulators and the community of the fire services involvement in the built environment. Um, so yes, the answer to, simple answer to that is yes. Thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate that answer. Um, next question. What options does a client have if the building surveyor or fire service in their area are requiring fire safety verification method to be used for their building? What if the client disagrees and wants to demonstrate compliance via straight performance solution instead? Um, look, I might open that up to both Paul and, and Mark just to provide a quick opinion on that question. Um, we'll let Mark go first, I think. I prefer if Paul went first. Um, so just to get it right, this is the what options does a client have if the building surveyor? Um, what if the client disagrees and wants to demonstrate compliance by a straight for? Um, I suppose we'll have to test that when it comes in. Um, at this stage, certainly um, the two paths to compliance, one of which we don't see, which is the deemed to satisfy. Um, and uh, the VM brings into play uh, a more, I suppose, a, a better rigor around um, the proof, if you like, uh, that a, a building complies with the safety requirements of the NCC. So, um, I think it'll be a good discussion between fire services and the building and the building surveyor um, if they want to demonstrate compliance via a straight performance solution instead um, then that is still available um, within the ncc and uh, the the vm as i said before is not mandatory so there are other paths to proving um, that a building is safe the design is safe over to paul Yeah, th th this is an interesting uh, question and um, uh, I, I guess the first thing I've got to do is talk about a, a profession that I'm not uh, part of um, and the first thing is that the building surveyor uh, 
represents the public interest. And the first thing they've got to decide is, is it in the public interest to uh, compare uh, a design against uh, deemed to satisfy, which has gone through various, um, uh, the deemed to satisfy provisions has gone through various checks and balances. And um, uh, then decide what is the most appropriate for the particular application. So that's the first decision that the, that ends up being made in a, a circumstances when a client insists on on going down a particular path. Um, the next one uh, would be what the fire safety engineer has to say. And again, uh, uh, engineers are uh, governed by a code of ethics and they have to act in the public interest as well. So the same questions would, would get asked. So um, my, my comment to that would be that they would be looking at which, which approach is in the uh, public interest, not the client's interest. There's an order that you follow when you're looking at your, applying your code of ethics. So they would have to have a look at, uh, at that. Uh, the tricky thing is when up front the client says you will do it and you will do it in this way. Um, but again, you, know, you can do something that looks very much like a, a fire safety verification method and it's a straight comparison anyway, which is a, an accepted fire safety engineering approach and has always been. So you can do the same scenarios, you can use the same comparative benchmark. So you know, there is a bit of flexibility if, if your client's saying you should do it in a certain way, you've got to ask the question, why are they asking you that question? And what expertise do they have? And you, you go from there based on the, on the needs of the problem. I don't know whether that's answered it fully, but that's my best shot. Thanks, Paul, appreciate that. Uh, next question's for Mark. How will, the, how will Fire and Rescue New South Wales or, or the other fire authorities across the country be consulted on the initial proposal of the fire safety verification method? Thank you. Um, I hope as early as possible. Um, we are a key stakeholder, and I think it would be in everyone's benefit for both um, a designer, a proponent, to share their ideas with the fire service, but also for the fire service to set expectations about how we view the safety of the building. So. I'm not sure how that will work in process in terms of, you know, submission of, of documentation or whether it is just sit down and share information with each other that helps guide um, the path to a safer building. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, Paul, I think this one's for yourself. Does table CV1 indicate that a building set out at a distance prescribed in the table is capable of withstanding the respective heat flux, or does it imply that the building is required to withstand the heat flux at the prescribed distance? Okay, uh, the, the quick answer is I'd have to look at the um, uh, NCC uh, and, and look it up, because I can't remember which table one is and which table two is, and, and they're quite complex, so I'd just go through it and have a look. Um, and that's consulting advice, nothing to do with the fire safety verification method. But if, if you want, I'll, I'll, I'll go away and have a look at it for a couple of minutes. Uh, no, look, I think we'll move on to the next question, Paul, which is, is the use of the fire safety VM only for comparative assessments and not absolute assessments? Um, yes, it is only for uh, comparative assessments. That doesn't mean that some of the content in the handbook and some of the content in the data sheets uh, wouldn't be useful for, for uh, uh, other forms of analysis, but the, the verification method is a comparative verification method. Um, and look, I think this will be our final question. Um, look, we'll also be reviewing these other questions that, that haven't been answered and um, letting them inform our other support material that we're looking to develop. Um, so apologies if we haven't answered your question yet, but don't threat. Um, the education team will be reviewing them and looking for gaps in our resources. Um, so this question is, please confirm, the DTS comparisons being discussed are all based on the handbook content and not actually written within the BCA 2019 Schedule 7. Um, look, I think I'll, I'll provide an ABCB response from that, which is um, the DTS comparison or the reference building design is something that, that, that has set within the assessment methods um, of the NCC for quite a while now. 
um, and Schedule 7 through itself is the process for developing that reference building design um, with further guidance provided within that handbook. Um, I, I think they've captured that probably pretty well, Paul, but uh, is there anything else you wish to add? Um, I, no, I think you've answered it well. The, the issue is that the, the, the verification method is a process. The handbook is essentially a process which fills in some of the spaces and gives advice on how you would apply the, the uh, uh, or should apply the FSVM and you go through your checks and balances with your uh, performance-based design brief team. So uh, essentially, yeah, I'm in line with what, what you said. I don't know whether uh, Mark's got anything else to add. No, I don't have anything else to add. I think that's right. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in and watching this webinar. Um, and look, a special thanks to uh, Mark Wilbrow for donating his time to present to yourselves and provide AFAC's input into uh, this. Um, it, it's really helpful for them to be involved in this. And also thank you to Paul England for, for providing the uh, fire engineering um, analysis or fire engineering responses to these questions. Um, look, if you're after any resources on the fire safety verification method, they are up live on our website now. The link is on the screen attached. Um, as Paul mentioned, there is the handbook and the data sheets. We also have some FAQs and the video from the last webinar that was conducted around the middle of last year. If you wish to go watch that, watch that and have a look at some of the questions that came out of that. Um, and we'll also be developing some more resources over the coming months to support the fire safety VM as we come towards 1 May. So please keep an eye out on our social media channels and emails, um, and they'll be letting you know as the resources come live. Um, and finally, in closing, there is a seminar, uh, sorry, a survey that will be popping up as this closes. We would really appreciate if you guys can all fill that out and um, help us collect some more information and make these things more useful to you as we keep going. Thank you.